This is Thursday, August 27th, 2015, and this is the beginning of an interview with Robert Cassetti, Senior Director of Creative Services and Marketing at the Cording Museum of Glass. I'm Marianne Hamblin, Special Collections and Archives Librarian at the Ray Cal Research Library. Uh, in this interview, we'll focus on your time designing at Stuben Glass. Okay. So could you start by stating your full name and give us a little bit about your background, uh, where you grew up? Sure. Uh, my name is Rob Cassetti. Uh, currently working at the Corning Museum of Glass and I have been for the last 16 years. And um, my time at Steuben was from, began in 1987. Um, and I started at Steuben as a, uh, basically the guy who did this, designed the store windows on Fifth Avenue and was, um, did visual merchandising for the store. Mm -hmm. My background's in design. I went to college at Carnegie Mellon University, studied design. Um, and uh, worked in a, began my career actually working in Corning. Got my first job out of college working in, uh, um, in the Corning area. Um, and uh, eventually found myself um, designing um, uh, for the kind of tabletop world. Mm -hmm. China, glass, silverware. Um, and, but I was doing both the actual design of the product but also the packaging, photography, graphic design, um, shop interiors. Um, so when I started looking for, for a job, um, and I was in the Philadelphia area at the time, when I started looking for a job through a headhunter, this position with Steuben became known, and, uh, and I was asked to, to go interview there. Okay. When did you know specifically that you wanted to go into glass and work with glass? Um, <laughs> It's uh, my, my um, I was a college intern um, working for Corning Consumer Products mm -hmm. in the basement of uh, C building. Mm -hmm. There's a, actually the basement of A building. There was a model shop where they made um, appearance models for uh, consumer product testing. We actually worked with the test kitchen, the famous uh, Corning Consumer Products test right. kitchen. And um, at the time there was a um, I forget the official name uh, of the, it was a consumer testing uh, center within the Corning Glass Center. So um, they'd make up, make these models, we'd build these models and they looked like the real thing. It looked like a, you know, percolator or a, you know, casserole dish or whatever. And um, um, made out of mahogany painted to look like Pyroceram or <laughs> plastic to look like Pyrex. And, um, and they, we'd make the models and then they would, um, uh, designers would, you know, to the designer's specifications. They would be shipped, uh, taken over to the um, testing area. People visiting the glass center would give their opinion on the products and then the research department would, you know, decide what would move forward and what wouldn't. So that was a, was a full-time job for me that summer, but there was a whole department devoted to making models, appearance right. models. Um, and on the side, we made, um, models for Steuben designers. And one of those designers was David Dowler. Mm -hmm. And David uh, was working on some small pressed animals and we, um, I forget actually if we made the plasters for him or, yeah, I think he brought over clay models and we turned them into plaster models and they would eventually be used for more sophisticated um, product development. Mm -hmm. At any rate, we made models and uh, Dave one day invited me um, to go over into the Steuben factory. And that summer I'd been in and out of different Corning factories um, and you know the factories where the, uh, across the river where the Corning headquarters is today. And it was you know it's thrilling to go inside of a glass factory and just the, the bustle and the energy of it and the hand shops were over there and you just watch them make you know stuff in production. But that didn't connect with me the way it did when I walked into the Steuben factory. And there was something about, and I still can't quite put my hands on it, other than I think the scale of it, it all suddenly clicked with me, that mm -hmm. this is kind of this amazing thing. Right. And we walked underneath the furnace uh, to where the hot glass is delivered, and standing underneath the furnace, and the furnace was in terrible repair, and you could see the glow of the glass between the bricks of the furnace, you're standing under this, wow. you know, <laughs> bathtub of molten glass, and it was leaking. You could see the glass dripping through, and there was a guy down there with a garden hose, you know, 
<laughs> cooling off the cooling hot, keeping the glass from you know melting through. And um, there's something about that moment that just absolutely clicked with me, and it was like, uh, I want you know, I love this. This is a really right. amazing thing. Um, so um, the summer ended. I you know that was 1977 maybe. Okay. And it was an, and 10 years later, I was interviewing for a job at Stuben mm -hmm. um, that I eventually got and started right. at Stuben in 1987. Okay. So what positions did you hold while you were there? So I started, as I said, started with designing windows. Mm -hmm. So the, um, I think it was my experience with store interiors and packaging and photography that connected uh, with Paul Schultz, who was the design director at the, at the time. Um, but I was hugely unqualified to do that job. I mean, later meeting people who were really good at it, it was, in retrospect, that's shocking. He hired me to do the job. Um, I did, um, uh, but it was, I think, the kind of versatility of my background. I was going to ask, what you know, do you think that he saw? Yeah. That well, Paul was an interesting guy, and, and um, he, connected with people in interesting ways. So um, he asked me what interested me about glass and I told him that when I was a kid, I loved going to this store where my mom would buy clothes where they had those adjustable mirrors, you know, the center mirror is okay. fixed and the two side ones move. Mm -hmm. And I used to like getting inside of it and closing it all around me. And I didn't know it at the time, but actually that's a, to design certain, uh, to design Stuben geometric objects, what are called prismatics, you really have to understand reflection deeply, okay. and I think it really appealed to him that you know that was my early like, on yeah my were, glass yeah. experience right, <laughs> um, and sure enough well, the in my career of designing for Subban I, I migrated in that direction and m my um, I think the pieces I enjoyed designing most were those prismatic designs oh, um, multi multi reflection mm -hmm. uh, designs um, so I think it was. You know, Paul's an interesting guy, and that may have appealed to him. And then the the versatility of my background, which you know, my career at Stuben then really leveraged. You know, all those experiences. Mm -hmm. So, designing the store interiors and the windows became was remarkably um, powerful first experience for me. Um, Why is that? So. It was really the first time in my career where I was directly in contact with customers. Mm. You know, it wasn't, I wasn't designing an abstract for an abstract person, right. um, but this person who was walking in off the street. And so I, you know, was on the hook every, I think it was every three weeks, had to have a new window, might have been every two weeks. And um, so what's it going to be? Mm -hmm. And what's the theme of the store interior going to be? And so I'd, and, and Stuben at the time I was running Fifth Avenue and, and 50, 56th Street, mm -hmm. and it was kind of the center of the universe. You know, Trump Towers across the street. You know, Harry Winston's the other way, um, mm -hmm. and 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 Stuben was an institution. And the Stuben windows, like the Tiffany windows, people look forward to. New Yorkers look forward to. What's what's the window going to be this week? So. You know, as I'm installing the window, people would literally be stopping and like art directing me from the street, you know, and move it to the left or, you know, they'd be shaking their head like, I don't see it coming together. And then the next day they literally walk into the store, you know, and I'd be in the store moving things around and they'd offer me them literally give me direct feedback. That's funny. What a and then the other thing that would be taking place is we'd make, you know, you're moving stuff around the store all the time and I'm working with the store manager and the design director. and the, it, I would, you know, you're making things look nice together, mm -hmm. right? You're decorating. Mm -hmm. And so you put this bowl with this face and a couple of things around and you get to know the product line. So I literally touched mm -hmm. and handled the entire product line for mm -hmm. 18 months or two years every day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a visual person, but I'm a tactile person and you, you, you're, you're processing it. Mm -hmm. It ceases to be abstract. And then, as you'd be doing that, you'd you know you get to know the line, you get to know the how what things work together, and all, you know, also get to see what's missing. Mm. Like, geez, I wish there was a vase that was this tall that would work well with this piece. Mm -hmm. um, and then, 
as you'd move stuff around and put things together, then you would see what customers react to. Because I'm, you know, I wasn't doing this after hours right. necessarily, so I, I'd be moving stuff around, and the customers would like suddenly gravitate towards something, an arrangement I made. So I got a tremendous amount of um, organic customer knowledge and organic product knowledge, mm -hmm. and so the um, and there was always a design. Um, so that's in the first floor, so the, the street first, level of the store, of the, of the of Stuben. Mm -hmm. Downstairs was the shipping department and the warehouse, the basement. Um, the ground floor was just strictly the retail shop and, you know, the back of the house where the retail people worked. And then uh, the second floor were the primary offices and the third floor was the executive suite. Okay. So on the second floor where, uh, where the design department was, um, there was a conference room, and in that conference room, they would have a monthly design meeting. And all the designers who designed product for Stuben would come. Some work full time, and some were consultants. Some were, you know, consultants on a long term basis, like people like Peter Aldridge and Eric Hilton. They fundamentally were staff members, but they weren't on staff. Okay. And other consultants were coming and going. You know, they're hired for a particular project. Short -term. Um, Another notable person at the time was Lloyd Atkins, who uh, was retired but con designed all the iconic hand coolers, mm -hmm. small pressed animals for Stupin. So there would be this great moment when people would fly in from Corning and there, the big design review would happen once a month. And Paul Schultz, design, design director, um, when he hired me said, you know, yes, you're doing the store windows, but any, anyone can always submit a design for the design meeting. So. And of course, that was my background. I designed mm -hmm. three-dimensional sure. objects. Um, so um, uh, after working in the store for however long it was and getting sort of building up this knowledge, um, it occurred to me, not, it wasn't just like, wouldn't this be a nice piece of Stuban, but this is a piece that's missing. Mm -hmm. okay. This is the thing that, in my mind, the customers were looking for and would fit in with the product line. It was kind of like the, the long lost cousin you never knew about suddenly arriving. So I, I drew this piece called that was eventually introduced called the Hellenic Urn. Mm -hmm. And um, it was designed to be an, a companion to the olive dish and some other pieces that had the distinctive scroll handle. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I submitted it to design review. First w thing I ever submitted, Went to the, des the design review, was like, yes, that's, you know, let's pursue that. Okay. Went into the line and it was, you know, it was a bestseller for years. So um, that was my, how I got my foot in the door for designing, designing product. Um, I should say, as a, in terms of the course of the history, I was, I was hired by Paul Schultz to, um, into the des department. He was the design director. Okay. The associate design director was a guy named Bernie, Sch um, Bernie Schultz. I'm forgetting his name. Bernie. It'll come to you. It'll come to me. <laughs> That's terrible, right? Um, Bernie Wolf. And, um, and Bernie uh, retired, and it was his position that I was brought in to, to fill okay. as the store, the visual merchandising guy. Um, before I, my first day at work, Paul Schultz. Uh, called me up and he said he was actually leaving, um, retiring as well. Oh. So the guy who hired me was disappearing, um, which is a little bit like, um, you know, you're on a, um, you know, a space mission and the rocket takes off and you're headed to the moon and then the planet you left just blew up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of major. <laughs> so um, uh, just as an aside, um, my... Uh, uh, I was left. I was left with the dilemma that I didn't have a boss. But more importantly, Stuben was left with the dilemma they had to fill the position of design director. One of the other jobs I was interviewing for when I was job hunting was with the uh, housewares company called Dansk, and which is a very influential um, company at the time in terms of uh, Scandinavian um, consumer housewares. And um, the design director at Dansk, I went for an interview, and the design director at Dansk just blew me away, this guy named Christopher Hacker, Chris Hacker. And um, 
And I remember going home, and I actually did Dansk in the morning and Stuben in the afternoon. I was living in Philadelphia. Drove home, and, met, and I was talking to my wife about it, and, he, and I said, you know, the, the job I want is I want the design director for Stu. I want to work for the guy from Dansk, but I want the Stuben job. <laughs> well, it turned out that, um, lo and behold, the guy who hired me for Stuben announced his retirement. Stuben needed to hire somebody to be the desi new design director, and I recommended the Chris man. Hacker, yeah. who I'd interviewed with at Dansk, who, lo and behold, was hired. So I get, my dream was actually fulfilled. Perfect. And so I got That's to work amazing. for Chris, um, um, and it was uh, fantastic. Um, I was right. It would, it's the right it job, and I was just perfect, perfect nice. working for him. Um, so, uh, so the design of the Hellenic Urn was my first Beginner, step yeah. into product design for Stuben. I became a, um, uh, a Ross, you know, that became a regular in terms of submitting designs, mm -hmm. and. Not long after that, um, I was promoted, and my w I was then able to hire a visual merchandising person mm -hmm. to replace to me, replace you. and a gentleman named Mark Tamayo who came from Bergdorf Goodman, and um, and you know what was a struggle for me to him came completely naturally, you know, and he was he is and was was and is. Uh, mm -hmm highly talented visual merchandising guy. Um, so uh, my role expanded. I designed product, but I also um, uh, was responsible for store design. So when we did freestanding stores within um, other um, stores like yeah. Neiman Marcus, for instance, uh, I was responsible for the design of those stores um, and uh, took on res eventually took on responsibilities for the identity of Stuben, the graphic look of the catalogs, you know, the brand shaping and reshaping of the brand. And at the time, the, the brand went, was go undergoing um, uh, something of a transformation. So a, a tremendous experience for me in terms of brand identity. Um, the other responsibility was uh, around exhibitions that we mounted. So Stuben at the time had, a, had a, an arrangement where they were the, the Stuben store was the preview location for exhibitions that eventually would open here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Okay. And by special arrangement, Stuben was able to do this. Um, and so I got a chance to design exhibitions of Corning Museum of Glass objects Perfect. at the Stuben <laughs> You can see where this is leading, I right? I do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the, my fate was you know, being rolled out in front of me. Um, and then the last piece of the equation was um, Stuben did uh, um, consolidate, made the decision to consolidate the space it occupied in the building on Fifth Avenue. Mm -hmm. So the uh, executive floor on the third floor was um, um, that part of the lease was concluded and the second floor was um, redesigned to accommodate all the functions that had been on the third floor moving down to the second floor. An architect was hired to do that, but I was, what, um, I was involved in the project management of that capital mm -hmm. project. Um, and so I, got, I became involved and got to know how Corning capital projects work mm -hmm. um, and how, to, how they're managed and how the, you know, what that looks like. Um, I was the technical, what was called the technical receiver of the project. I was basically responsible for representing Stuben okay. um, uh, as the client. Um, Corning Incorporated was funding the project and architects were involved. So I had to, I had to you know, kind of navigate that and mm -hmm. then also I was responsible for the final design approval okay. uh, or, the, uh, or the design approval working with the design director, Chris Hacker. So. Um, so I was doing exhibits, I was doing brand identity, I was in, engaged with a customer, I was engaged with a retail store design, <laughs> uh, and now I'm doing you know, capital okay. project um, management. Um, management. So fundamentally all the things that is uh, my job today, um, mm -hmm. yes. it, it was <laughs> all those components were happening right. uh, in New York at, at, at Stupend. Okay, and was that, that was mid-90s maybe, or? Earlier? It was from, um, um, 
basically 1987 until uh, the early 90s, 92, 93, uh, and when some transitions uh, began to happen. Mm -hmm. um, before leaving that chapter behind, I think it's, um, it was a remarkable moment. I mean, people who work for Stuben are so, um, have such fond, it's a fond place in their life mm -hmm. and in their hearts. I've, I've said that there's no one who ever worked from Stu Ben who didn't leave bitter. <laughs> and the reason is, is that it's a, it was this sort of golden place of promise and it never quite felt like you got there. Okay. Um, uh, and there's, you know, we could talk about that at length, but the, um, I had a chance during my period at Stuben. I was going to say it was a wonderful period to be there, but every period was wonderful to be at Stuben. Mm -hmm. My moment at Stuben, and just let's just call it that ten-year window of eighty-seven and ninety-seven. Um, it was a little longer than that, but mm -hmm. you know, I was able to work with the generation of people that actually worked with Arthur Arthur Houghton. Okay. And um, when I was at Stuben was uh, early on uh, was when you know Arthur Houghton was still copied on correspondence he would you know he would uh, appear a couple times of e a year mm -hmm. major decisions still had to be run by him mm -hmm. um, he was a figure in the organization still very much his company yeah, yeah. Um, although he was long since retired you know mm -hmm. Arthur Houghton retired T Tom Beekner took over as president mm -hmm. of Stuban um, then Davis Kyoto than uh, Susan King. So as president of Stuben, I worked under Susan during her, her tenure. Um, so there was that echo of Arthur mm -hmm. and the way things should be. And, um, and the, you know, the third floor executive suite was his place. I mean, it still felt like Arthur Houghton's offices that other people happen to be occupying today. The <coughs> liquor cabinet still had liquor that he had purchased. <laughs> and the whole thing had a kind of, uh, certainly the third floor, well, but the organization at some level still had a kind of madman feel about it. <laughs> the, um, the, you know, the walnut paneled, you know, mm -hmm. executive suite and the secret little, right. um, you know, executive bathrooms. And uh, there was a certain air about it. And it was intimidating to people. I mean. Mm. High-powered people would get, get off the elevator at the third floor, and it was... Mm, made a statement. There was power <laughs> in that space. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, and during, when I was there, uh, Arthur, it was when Arthur Houghton passed away. Okay. Um, and you could feel the earth shift. Right. The, but the echo of it was still very, very strongly there. Um, and Tom Beekner, who was, you know, hugely present, although he also was retired, uh, kind of took on that mantle of Arthur. Okay. I'll give you a Tom Beekner example. Yeah. So Tom uh, was, like Arthur, was hugely particular about anything that would change relative to the brand and the store and the statement of luxury that the student made. And um, we had a sign painter who would come and he would hand letter the hours the store was open in gold, you know, like whatever the technique mm -hmm. is, it looks like gold paint, but it had a gold leaf thing to it. And he would, you know, just have this stick out and he'd put his hand, it was just gorgeous, you know, mm -hmm. just old world. And, um, and to complement that, we had, I mean, just in the same school, when you did an uh, inscription on a custom piece, you know, you're getting married and you had a little piece and was, you know, want to commemorate the marriage or whatever, there was a staff of calligraphers upstairs, uh, three calligraphers, and they did all the custom inscriptions, were done by hand by, you know, world-class calligraphers, and then they were sandblasted, or a technique that's too been called monaired on the surface of the glass. So it wasn't, you know, get to the computer and the lettering happens, right? This is all done, this is yeah. premium. So things were done a certain way. Um, one day, the, 
I come into work when this was still when I'm doing the windows, and the revolving door is broken. The front door was a revolving door. And so I needed a sign to go on the side to, to say, know. please use the side <laughs> entrance. You know, pardon, you know, temporary inconvenience, whatever, right? So this is, this is a brand crisis, right? So I run upstairs, I get one of the calligraphers to make me a sign on 100% rag paper, and I'm going downstairs and I'm looking for a sign holder and I can't find a sign holder, and the store's about to open. It's store to open at 10, and it's like two minutes to 10. There are people coming into the door. And so I run upstairs and I take this and I put a piece of scotch tape on the back of it, trim the edges with an X-Acto knife, so it's perfectly aligned with it. It's not like two little pieces of tape on the side, right? It's this perfectly straight line. I, 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 I put it on the window, I burnish it on there so that it's this you know, absolutely <laughs> perfect rectangle of tape. This gorgeous sign is hanging there. It's only gonna be up an hour until the guy comes and fixes the door. And, and it's like, okay, the store opens, I go upstairs, I'm in, I go in my office, and not 20 minutes later, the phone rings and it's Tom Beekner. And he said, you never tape a sign to the window of the store, ever. That's the kind of place it was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, well, I knew, right? But, you know, it was, you know, it was an emergency. Had an emergency. <laughs> so uh, it was um, very old, kind of old world mm -hmm. sensibility mm -hmm. uh, about it. People, um, the generation, the Houghton generation, all address each other as Mr. and Miss, Mrs. and Miss. No first names. Interesting. So uh, I was lucky enough to overlap with that, mm -hmm. with that, with that generation. So as it shifted, what happened? How did? What were the changes? Well, the you know the perennial difficulty with Stuban uh, to to you know quote Marie McKee was we didn't sell enough glass, <laughs> and um, and there was pressure from uh, Corning to at least break even. And, and the, what was generally understood then in 1987 was the same problem it was in 1977 and the same problem it was in 2007, which was um, the, the concern that the current generation of customers was dying off. How are we gonna appeal to this new generation? What we have is not, we don't believe is appealing to them. What, what should we do? So management came and went, but it was always the same problem you're trying to solve. Okay. Excuse me. And the, um, so the, uh, at the time, um, we embarked on a number of things. One was a redesign of the store. That was a cap part of the capital project. We consolidated offices upstairs, and we, re we, we redesigned the store downstairs. And, and this was this e economics? This was to appeal. Just to appeal. To appeal. Okay. The store looked dated and, okay. looked, you know, sort of um, the original kind of glory of the store from the 1950s had, had eroded and been kind of renovated into a, um, something that had lost its charm. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it, you know, it looked, it, it was in the 1980s and it looked like 1970s, right? Yes. So Gotta do something. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, Design direction was to engage notable uh, pe uh, people from the design and architecture community, guest designers, to come. Mm -hmm. So we hired Michael Graves, Richard Meyer, the mm -hmm. architect, um, are two of the most notable projects we worked on, Massimo Vignelli, um, and worked with them on projects that were felt to um, would you know be press worthy and also uh, attract a new customer. Um, so they're you know, kind of very high profile events um, uh, for that generation of Subban. Um, so kind of a freshening of the look and then it was a new advertising campaign and you know, all the usual th kind of things you'd imagine that we would do. Uh, all of it seemed revolutionary for Stuben, which had up until that time been very steady in its commercial presence. Mm -hmm. You know, had a Tiffany-like quality that you know you always get the <coughs> catalog. Always had the same flavor, and the store always was the same. And there was a reassurance 
mm -hmm. in that. That's what people wanted, yeah. yeah. Um, and so this, these were um, seemingly radical changes that Steven was making. And so um, it was fun to be part of that. It was very exciting to be part of that. Um, I think that period is looked back on um, favorably as uh, some very smart moves that, that Steven made at the time. Um, in the M.J. Madigan book about the history of Steven, that um, um, I was pleased to see how favorably that, that period mm -hmm. was, was described. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was um, first of all, it makes you feel old to read about <laughs> read about your, your accomplishments in a, in a, in in a, history. In a history book. <laughs> um, but it was, a, it, was, it was an exciting period. It was great. Mm -hmm. It was great. And, um, uh, and it was still in the period where some um, serious investment was going on. Um, and so interesting things came out of it. Mm -hmm. Sounds wonderful. So uh, let's talk about when you design yourself. What is your design process? I sure. Mean. So um, it was amazing to work for Steven because they had such um, tight standards. The, the aesthetic of Steuben is uh, very described, uh, very prescribed. The process of design review, it's a peer review. Mm. Often we're a number of designers working on the same problem. Mm. And there was a, you know, and it, you learned it very quickly when you'd look at a bunch of designs put on the table and people, you know, be like, well, this one, you know, this has, they, they would be critiquing and then somebody would put something on the table and literally people would just like conversations over that's the one you could tell wow. you could tell when it became Steuben hmm. and um, and so people would say that's and in the the rest of the world you know I'll be out you know shopping or whatever in a museum and you'd see an object and that's not Steuben but you say that's Steuben mm -hmm. like it fits it, it fit it look, yeah. right and um, and so the, the staff designers uh, certainly got it, and then uh, consulting designers would, would get it. You know, they'd quickly figure out what the aesthetic was. Part of that was that you had so, you were so tightly constrained. You had very limited production methods. You know, you could make things by offhand, you know, in the blowing room, glass blowing or gla hot sculpting. But the, but the material, the lead crystal, kind of wanted to be certain shapes, and you know it's hard to make it really paper thin. It has to have a certain mass, um, and then the surface quality of a Steuben object is so high that certain techniques couldn't be used because they would leave too many marks. Okay. So your repertoire of things you could do, you know, if you think about glass blowing at CMOG, your repertoire is incredibly wide. You put it inside of lead crystal, you put all the surface, you know, damage concerns, and then you put the Steuben aesthetic on top of it, and you were in this tiny little window of things you could do. Um, and the same thing was true with um, the uh, cut, you know, cut glass forms, um, uh, prismatic forms and geometric forms. Uh, you found yourself in this tiny little box that you could design in. And, you know, I've described it as, you know, you're, you know, if, if, if regular glass making is a symphony orchestra, all the instruments and all this stuff, this was the equivalent of one or two instruments, you know, you only can wow. do so much. So, um, I really like that. I like highly constrained design problems. You know, I'd much rather renovate a house that has a set of problems than have a blank sheet of paper and say design any house mm -hmm. you want. And so this was like huge, this was hugely constrained. In terms of surface decoration, we only had a certain number of things we could do. We had copper wheel engraving, which is extremely constraining in terms of what you can and can't do, certainly but anything that would be affordable. Mm -hmm. So I would, um, so 
as a starting point, that was a really a place I really liked being. And, and so I would often just be turning that problem around in my head all the time. Mm. I found myself designing geometric objects with surface decoration and um, that would then reflect multiple times within the object and create these, um, these worlds of illusion. And I, I, I started relatively simply, but I really fell in love with the technique. And, um, and I found myself literally walking around the world looking at opportunities to translate what I was seeing in the world into those objects. I, I lived in New York, I lived in New York City on uh, the Upper West Side and there was this church across the street and I would wake up in the morning and like most people would be like the blue sky you know this and that and I would be trying to turn that church into a Stuben object. <laughs> I did it for years like every every morning you know trying to figure out the light and the shadow and how that could work and I just my brain was always there yeah. and um, and, and I think the people who designed for Stu Ben well, um, you know, I'll, I'll pick Lloyd Atkins as an example who designed the hand coolers for many, many years. There was a virtuosity. They achieved the virtuosity in understanding all of the constrained, all the things that were constraining mm -hmm. and overcoming them worked beyond that yeah. to make something new and make discoveries and um, I, I think in geometric designs especially I, I got to that virtuosity place mm -hmm. um, and the, the last design review I ever attended um, as a product designer um, it was one of those moments where a bunch of stuff had been put forward and we hadn't, nobody sat in, around the table and said, that's too bad. Yeah, it didn't happen. Right. Now this is probably early 90s and Marie McKee was the president of Stuben by that point. Mm -hmm. um, instead of it just being a bunch of designers around the table, it's designers, marketing people. I mean, it's a huge mm -hmm. meeting, 30, 40 people, 30 <laughs> meeting, easily 30 people are in the room. And, and I remember sitting there thinking about all the things I'd heard, manufacturing and the marketing person and themes that they were wishing we were exploring. And I, I bet you there's drawings in the Raycow Library. We do have. I, uh, I, I drew this piece, which later would be called Perfect Timing. I might have named it at that moment when I drew it. And it shows clock parts and, you know, gears. And, mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't like a sketch like a, a, a schematic sketch. It was like, I was drawing like how it would reflect. I mean, it was, I'm, cause I had, pro, you know, I was so in that world. Mm -hmm. I, I had that virtuosity. I don't have it today. I had that virtuosity mm -hmm. at that moment. I was so well practiced mm -hmm. that I could draw a piece of glass and imagine how it would reflect uh, to a very high degree of accuracy. And I drew it with a pencil just on a piece of, you know, like notebook paper I had. And, um, and I, I literally like put it on the table and people were like, that's, that's it. it. <laughs> that's funny, right on the spot. <laughs> right on the spot. And, um, you know, you don't have many moments like that in your life, right? Um, but it really, uh, to me, kind of underscored that uh, you live it and breathe it and consume it and understand it, mm -hmm. um, and and I wasn't alone. The Stuben Design Department staff all the reason they were around because was they that they achieved that, that level, right? They mm -hmm. could they were they were fluent in in it and were had a virtuosity about about their mm. design skills, mm -hmm. oh. which didn't necessarily translate that you were good at designing anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Very specific. You just happen to be good at this, you know. So did you work design individually or with teams or both? Typ typical, almost without exception, desi student designers designed on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, you would offer each other advice, especially mm -hmm. in the design review, but the, the design department was very intentionally, you know, everyone worked together. Um, and, 
you know, uh, the offices were in New York. Uh, I should say that, that Arthur Houghton strongly believed in the separation of the designer and the maker. That, that, that the maker, the, whether it's somebody in the factory or in, in today's context, a glass artist, is arguably too close to the material to push it, to push the boundaries of it. They know that if you take the paddle and you do this, the glass is going to resist you, and so they don't design beyond that. They're constrained by what you can make. And he believed there was, you needed to understand the material enough, that's, that's why the designers always were in the factory, to go see their work made, but it was best for them to be remote, to be inspired by other things, to not be burdened by the day-to-day -day realities mm -hmm. of what manufacturing was, to be a little bit more free and a little bit more adventurous and be exposed to other uh, influences mm -hmm. that they could then bring to the process to the of design and to the factory floor. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why the design department was in New York City. That's why the business was headquartered in New York City while the factory was here in Corning. Um, the um, Corning Incorporated, I'll do a tiny little bit of history there. About the relationship. So, so um, Corning acquired Steuben in 1918 uh, from Frederick Carter. And, um, and in 1933, Arthur Houghton took over the management of Steuben. And so Frederick Carter was ousted. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Houghton took over and he took the, the new 10M formula, lead crystal formula that Corning had developed um, earlier, I believe a year earlier in 1932, and proclaimed that that would be the um, only thing that Stuben would make. Mm -hmm. So the water, water clear, or as we like to say gin clear, um, crystal formula, and the colorful glass of Frederick Carter was banished. Um, the, so from, so from 33 until, and, and with that, um, the decision was to close all points of distribution and open a single store in New York City on Fifth Avenue. And it was located in, um, what is now the Bergdorf Goodman building, uh, on a, a ground floor shop location that had formerly been a restaurant. And Houghton made a big, was extremely interested in the idea of luxury, of crystal existing in a luxury category that it did not exist before. He, 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 he drew comparisons with jewelry and crystal. Mm -hmm. He wanted people to think about that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and certainly, um, you know, silver and, and it, it, to elevate the status of the material. And um, there are great dissertations about that that you know Steuben published at yeah. the time about the achieving that. Yeah. He was really going from the playbook of, um, of a, for lack of a better description, that Walter Dorwin Teague had written in 1932, envisioning what Steuben could become. Uh, under Frederick Carter's leadership, they, um, Carter was authorized by Corning to hire Walter Dorwin Teague, who was a, uh, arguably the famous, most famous, or one of the most famous industrial designers in the world. And, um, and he was brought in a consultant to reimagine Steuben. And Teague wrote the playbook that envisioned just using the colorless crystal, the high luxury status of it. He, he said that Steuben should be equated to a, uh, its ownership that should be equated to the equivalent of owning a Cadillac 16, a 16 cylinder Cadillac, most one of the most luxurious cars you know, in, of, it, mm -hmm. of its day, which was an outrageous statement at the time. Mm. Um, and so uh, Teague wrote a brilliant manifesto, but it took Arthur Houghton to really to make it real. To embrace that, and yeah. To make it real, yeah. uh, and, and, and his, his vision and his taste and his elegance, but also his resources. Mm -hmm. 
and the world he lived in, you know. <laughs> um, so um, Houghton decided to open the store on Fifth Avenue, and the first one was in the Bergdorf Goodman building. The second one was a purpose-built building um, at the where Harry Winston is today, at the corner of 56th and, and, and 5th. And then the third one was built across the street um, that was the Corning Building. It was a freestanding 24-story um, building, I think, 23 or 24-story building. Uh, a, a, a sky a glass skin modernist okay. mid-century skyscraper on Fifth mm -hmm. Avenue. So when that building was built, it was a Corning Incorporated building that they leased out to other tenants. Stuben was on the ground floor. Corning had offices on the 23rd, and then there was a executive club, on the I believe, on the 24th floor. And, um, and then Corning made the decision to sell that building. That building opened in the, in the 50s. Um, and they made the decision to sell that building in the 70s. And, and Steuben had a lease, a sweetheart deal of a lease, that was coming to an end. Okay. And, um, and so first the consolidation to mm -hmm. reduce the square footage of occupancy. Mm -hmm. And then that happened again, and the square footage of the occupancy shrank again. And the decision was made to move the majority of the business operations from New York City to Corning. And so, um, you know, in, the, in an effort to reduce rent mm -hmm. because they knew the rent was going to be rising in the not too distant future. Um, the, uh, so the, the design department uh, was relocated to Corning and that desired separation that Arthur Houghton was so mm -hmm. careful to manage um, came to an end and the, the designers literally worked upstairs in, in, you know, from the factory and had daily contact with the, the restrictions of what it took to manufacture Steuben objects. Mm -hmm. um, the well, I'm fascinated by that relationship between the designer and the crafts people and the glass blowers. Um, so, I mean, that must have changed once they were all together and like you said they were I mean I'm curious as how the evolution of the design into the object and okay and the different influences sure sure um, it's certainly certainly the move to Corning um, changed that relationship but quite frankly it was a relationship that was very that had dramatically changed over time mm -hmm. so the, the reality was that to design in Steuben, you had to be in the factory. Mm -hmm. To get it, a product through the approval processes, mm -hmm. marketing, manufacturing, you had to spend a lot of time in the factory. So a number of designers elected to live in Corning already. Mm -hmm. David Dowler, Eric Hilton, Peter Aldridge all lived in or near Corning. And, um, and for those of us that didn't, we were on the company plane every week to, be, to get to Corning. <laughs> so I, I lived in New York City, but I, I had an apartment in Corning and lived there two to three days a week. Mm -hmm. um, so you know every glass blower by name, and you know it's, it wasn't this formal separation that it mm -hmm. had originally been imagined, and, and okay. um, that had evolved, you know, fairly dramatically mm -hmm. over time. To get a, to get an object made you would, and the simplest example is, is in the blowing room. Um, it was, the, you, um, you had a certain number of uh, what were called moves, four hour p shifts, where you could experiment without, and, and there was, it was budgeted within the department that, you know, okay, Rob, you know, I went to, you know, I showed the thing at the design review, they said yes, okay, and when they say yes, you basically got three shots in the blowing room to make it. And it's budgeted, you know, it's an internal mm -hmm. charge to go do that. And, um, you know, sometimes you were successful and sometimes you weren't. Uh, the maddeningly, the first sample the guy makes, it's like, that's it, fabulous. <laughs> but you need to demonstrate repeatability. And so then they make the next one and it's 
well, maybe it's not so easy. They make oh. the third one, and sometimes you're chasing after this thing mm -hmm. that never really comes together. Okay. And there's you know, a lot of heartbreak. You know, I said, you know, there, you, leave this, you leave bitter, <laughs> right? Because you know, the, the one that got away, right? <laughs> you couldn't quite get that one. Um, so you developed a very close relationship with the glass blowers mm -hmm. and uh, makers in general. Mm -hmm. And so then it goes through the manufacturing. You know, so let's say you make a good one. And, um, but then it's got all these surface scratches. So now the, the process at Steuben was they, they would literally um, re what was called repair the surface of the object mm -hmm. that had just been made which was basically by grinding and polishing any scratches off. And it's, it's, um, you know, it's very labor intensive. Mm -hmm. Steuben didn't use um, acid polishing, which is typical in the industry. They would use abrasives to, and you know, down to jeweler's rouge to, <laughs> re to polish the surface of the glass. Um, so that, while you might think you have a winner, then Too you have all these work. added costs. Yeah. And then the, you'd have a design review and or a manufacturing review, and um, you begin to see if the product is feasible. Mm -hmm. So you'd have a couple shots in the blowing room, two, three, four. You know, you go, oh my God, we're so close. Can I have one more, please? Kind of thing. <laughs> you know, you, I, I sat through. Eventually, I'm in management, right, and I'm listening to designers <laughs> On the other begging side, yeah. me, right, <laughs> and um, uh, and so you're you're pursuing that. Mm -hmm. You go through, and that was um, uh, the experimental phase, and then um, the next phase would be demonstrate repeatability for manufacturability, and so now it's on the manufacturing side of the mm -hmm. ledger, and they all, they were much more. You've got two, you know, you got three shots to demonstrate you, you can make this, and how how many can you make per four hour shift, and then we're going to mm -hmm. base our pricing on that. Um, so you're kind of you're really in the trenches sorting that all out. That's very different than other product development. You know, the design department sends the sketch to the factory, a sample comes back, yeah. right? This is, com this is totally different, mm -hmm. you know? You're seeing a sausage getting made, and you know, you're in the middle of it, and you're, you're pleading, you know, you know, come on, I know you can say you can only make four in a shift, but could you make five? Is there any way you can make five? You know, we have to hit this price point, and five is the, and so you, you know, it's very personal. Mm -hmm. Um, so, really, you know, you ask about the process of, you know, from product, you know, the getting the design, and in many ways, it was just a very, um, it was all about the people you were working with, mm -hmm. the, in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, what is so remarkable to me personally is that okay, the guy who is shepherding the projects through the process on the manufacturing side, who I was doing battle with about, I need to get four <laughs> and not five because I won't, you know, I can't hit the price point, was Steve Gibbs, mm -hmm. who I eventually hired to run our hot glass mm -hmm. programs at the museum. Um, and the, the makers who I was working with on the floor trying to get something done and you know, seeing them struggle, trying, trying to figure out how to do it mm -hmm. on the blowing room floor. Um, were, you know, two of them were Lynn Labar and um, Don Pierce, who were the first guys we hired to do hot glass demonstrations at the, here at the museum. So those personal relationships and, you know, the, what we'd all been through together and, um, and the love of the material mm -hmm. all came we with me. Together, yeah. um, you know, came to the museum, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I, I left Steuben to join the museum. Mm -hmm. That's quite a connection. So what other designers worked there when you were there? Mm -hmm. You've mentioned a few. Yeah. The, um, um, so, so when I first started, the, um, there were the Aldridge, Dow Dowler, and Hilton were the, the senior guys. Okay. And um, uh, it was myself and a, and a designer named Neil Cohen who designed the iconic Starstream. Neil left not shortly after I started in 87. He might have been there through 88, I, I can't remember. And, um, and, and his, 
departure, um, he was replaced by a guy named Joel Smith, who eventually became the associate design director um, uh, of, of, of Steuben. Um, and, um, and Joel was teamed up with, um, kind of in short order, we hired a designer named Peter Drobny. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Peter was kind of the mastermind, knew so much about glass and the glass world. He, he was a designer, very virtuosic designer, but really helped to problem solve manufacturing problems. Mm -hmm. He could get things made because he understood the manufacturing process so well. And he understood the glass world so well. He was very connected into the, the, the world of gla the glass art society and glass artists and the, and the resources the glass artists used that Steuben originally, I mean, they were not unaware of. So, you know, as a good example, the, the blowing irons, the blowpipes that Steuben used were, were incredibly crude. They were, they were manufactured locally Mm -hmm. And the glass, glass artists, you know, were buying Steiner <laughs> blowpipes. You know, they were so much more sophisticated and elegant and cheap, well, cheaper mm -hmm. compared to the locally mm -hmm. manufactured one. So Peter, you know, introduced Stuben mm -hmm. to that. So he brought that, you know, that set of skills. Um, that was really the core team mm -hmm. um, for the, the majority of my tenure. Lloyd Atkins also was retired and he kept doing designing hand coolers. Uh, we, we knew Lloyd's, um, Lloyd would, we would have to replace that skill and, uh, and hired a designer named Taff Schaefer. And Taff uh, picked up that skill of designing um, small pressed animals um, and animal forms. And you know, today when people think of the Steuben animals, mm -hmm. more often than not, they're thinking of Taff, Taff Schaefer. Oh, okay. And she really Later. picked up the mantle and became virtuosic in, mm -hmm. in her, her skill set. So what was the dynamic? It sounds like everyone brought a particular skill set and mm -hmm. knowledge. Yes. Um, how did all that work together? Was it competitive? Was it collegial? Um, it was, I would say it was both co competitive and collegial. Okay. <laughs> um, you, you knew the, you know, the, Steuben would only introduce so many new products a year. Mm -hmm. Um, everybody had great ideas, and so there was a, a, a real sense of, you know, can I get mine through the system? And, um, and some jealousy that some people just had a knack mm -hmm. of doing it, mm -hmm. and, um, and some, you know, some people it was, it was more of a struggle. Um, the, uh, and, and there always was a sense of, um, and, and, and people did specialize. I, I ended up specializing in geometric mm -hmm. forms and you know, got good at it. And other people, the TAF, uh, focused on animal forms and mm -hmm. she was exceptionally good at it. Um, and so part of it was that comp competition was with what's popular today. Oh. We need more of this, you know, from a marketing mm -hmm. perspective or a manufacturing perspective. And so who can fill that void? Mm -hmm. um, I remember at one point, the um, Steuben, the manufacturing went through cycles of building up talent and then laying off talent, mm -hmm. and it was which was hugely frustrating because mm -hmm. uh, because based on business, right. you know, so it's a sad. down year and we have to save money in the factory and so we're going to lay off, you know, X number mm -hmm. of skilled craftsmen, mm -hmm. and 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 so what did that mean? They worked they worked in Steuben's, uh, excuse me, in uh, they were union employees, they worked for Corning, uh, and so you could literally see somebody, you know, w one of the great glass engravers in the world, being laid off, and he's emptying the garbage in the factory because wow. he, he, he bumped somebody else in the union system. And so, hmm. the, and of course, you know, from a completely selfish perspective, if I'm good at designing that stuff, and I've got ideas of new products, and I know that those products are what Steuben customers want, I see opportunities closing down if all this talent is mm -hmm. suddenly unavailable to me. So there was one point where there was going to be this huge layoff of engraving, and it, we were told, the good news is people were mm -hmm. talking, right? And uh, they were going to lay, lay off you know, a number of engravers. And so we got together in the design department and it said, okay, everybody just stop. And everybody designed engraving projects. 
and we need them for the next design review because we we want to we want to put something on a table so that we're not going to lay these people off. Mm -hmm. So uh, a bunch of us did did that, and um, those products went into manufacturing like very rapidly. Mm. You know, so it's altruistic. Mm. You know, I want to save mm -hmm. this so skill set. I, I I care about this person. I'd hate to see them sweeping the floor. But it's also mm. completely self-serving. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to get more products <laughs> through the pipeline, right? <laughs> right? And so. Uh, um, I don't know what it was, three, four of us put these um, designs came through. It's lucky, you're lucky to get one engraving project in a whole mm -hmm. year and suddenly we had a bunch of them get approved and in manufacturing mm -hmm. and turned around and inside of like, I, it seemed like six weeks. Mm -hmm. And I remember it being in the New York store and we made a deal, but we had them all on display together and it was like, it was a miracle. It's like, wow, look at look, look what just happened. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, sure enough, no engravers got laid off. In fact, they were all working overtime trying to keep up with the, you know, the production for this. So, um, hugely satisfying, you know, mm -hmm. to be able sure. to, to be able to do that. It also underscores that Stu Ben was very nimble. It was I, I like to think of it not as a small factory, but as a large studio, mm -hmm. where a studio can turn something around very quickly. And, mm -hmm. and Stu Ben had that ability. Um, so, it was, it was a remarkable place to work, to um, because things could be turned around very, very quickly, and you could see your idea realized very quickly. Mm -hmm. Was there a requirement to produce a certain number of successful products, or? You bet. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's uh, the uh, designers who were not productive that way um, you know just it was a, it was an issue you mm -hmm. you had to be productive mm -hmm. in terms of and they might have been very very skilled but just weren't producing what was selling right so okay. right, right. Mm -hmm. um, Stuben also had did very high-end um, sculptural works so the um, uh, were called exhibition designs and so these could, you know, be pieces, you know, ten thousand, fifteen, twenty, forty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, very small editions, and so you could, you, and there were people that really specialized in that end of the spectrum. So, I think what ended up happening is people found their niche where they were productive, mm -hmm. could see things through, they were seen as contributors, and then they kind of stuck in that, you know, in, mm -hmm. in that group. You do a little stuff. You venture off, do something, but you kind of found yourself, you know, going back to that, that, right. that core, um, core area. Mm -hmm. What about commissions? Special commissions. Um, so, uh, uh, so people would come and say, "I want to commemorate, you know, this moment," mm -hmm. and uh, um, and so those are categories of of, gla of products called special commissions. And uh, so they could be very commercial, or they could be, you know, ethereal. You know, um, um, uh, very, uh, very poignant. So, um, uh, Holocaust memorial sculpture, mm -hmm. for example, um, uh, is a special commission, and so is a retirement gift for a CEO. Mm -hmm. um, there was uh, a salesman or a sales uh, person that handled special commissions, sometimes in the sales office, one or two people might get inquiries and they would be funneled to this, this individual, mm -hmm. Cliff Palmer, uh, manage the, the special commissions. Mm -hmm. and, the, and he would fundamentally broker the deal with the customer. Mm -hmm. You know, the designer would be identified by the design director, you know, okay, Cliff, you're gonna work with Joel Smith and you're gonna, you know, he's your person mm -hmm. and go work on this project together. Um, I found them to be unbelievably satisfying projects because, it, um, again, it was very prescriptive. Right. You're solving a very specific problem. Mm -hmm. um, the, and, and Stuben did a few of them every year and over time, that opened up to where it became a more and more substantial 
important part of the business. And so more design department resources got aimed at special commissions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was in, I, I did a few, I didn't do a lot of them, I did a few. Um, um, one was to commemorate the, um, the, uh, the British coming to Virginia <laughs> uh, to uh, found the Jamestown colony. And so the, um, and so the, the, it was commissioned by the state of Virginia to commemorate the, um, the voyage. Um, and it was the, the uh, image of a ship that was sculptural that was then given to um, this, the, the um, um, I'm not exactly sure what, uh, I, I can't re recall the, um, it's not the people of England, but the, basically oh, the government. Okay. And, <laughs> um, and it actually now sits in the uh, Speaker of the House um, uh, and was in Westminster Abbey. Oh. So there's a big, you know, fancy <laughs> thing where the delegation for Virginia goes and, you know, a fancy, you know, a ceremony handover. So you can imagine, it's just... Yeah, very All kinds of fun awesome to design things. it, and you know, the kind of budget's no issue, and you, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's it's a joy. Um, the one that I did that I that really resonates the most with me, and it and it, it kind of really drove home for me what Stuben was was a retirement gift for um, the the retiring chairman of a company that eventually became known as Sprint Telecommunications. <laughs> and, and this was a guy who, um, and th th so it's an insight into the process. So, mm -hmm. okay, you're designing the retirement gift for this telecom guy, mm -hmm. right? And so here's his biography. And you don't really have much more than that. And so I was totally inspired by this guy's value. He was a lineman you know, work, he's a worker guy who <laughs> eventually ends up in management and reimagines the company and turns it into this mm -hmm. huge, powerful telecom in the Midwest. And, um, um, and then he's retiring. And they're, they're, they were headquartered in, um, in um, Kansas City, <laughs> which is also the headquarters of Hallmark Cards. And so I'm really inspired by this guy's story. And then um, his personal symbol is the eagle. And, um, and so I designed this piece. And it's, you know, it's not the greatest piece of glass in the world, but it was, you know, it was I, I liked it. it. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and it showed this eagle in flight. It's all copper wheel engraved. And he's, the eagle's holding this optical fiber because they, they okay. were pioneers in using optical fiber. And, it, and the optical fiber is like twirling around this mm. big bowl form all the way to the base, and there's this glowing thing in the bottom. And, Sounds beautiful. Um, it was called Eagle's Thunder. And um, <laughs> so I um, design it. And it's, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's going to be shipped off to him. There's going to be some ceremony, and they're going to give it to him. And, um, and so I get a call, and I'm actually invited to go to the presentation. Mm -hmm. And I go to the presentation. It's the it's their board meeting in Kansas City, and the um, and it's it's this everything I knew about this guy made real, right? And they have these <laughs> presentations, and there's this giant trade show honoring his life, and all these pictures, and you know, it's like wow, this is this is awesome, you know, and and I was kind of into it, right? And and I'm. Um, we were, he didn't know it was coming, the Subban thing was coming, so we were presented as, my wife and I went, as members of some board member's family, okay. right? We're just in, kind of invisible <laughs> there. And there are employees there and senior, and so there's this giant trade show thing, and then they have a board dinner, which is much more intimate, and, you know, presentation after presentation, and it's, and it's not to be politically incorrect, but it's the Midwest, and nobody is expressive, right? It's all very factual. 
and there's sort of dry presentations and you know the kind of things where you would be expect the sort of the emotional poignancy of the moment, right? None of it's happening. And I'm just sort of like, <laughs> you got to be kidding me. So, um, and the reason I brought up Hallmark cards is that I firmly believe there's a reason the Hallmark cards exist in K Kansas City. Yeah, we did this subject. Because <laughs> it's in the, in the land of people who can't express themselves, <laughs> you need a, a, a vehicle that does it for you, <laughs> right? And so the, I, I've, I had gone to the, there's a Hallmark card museum. It's kind of the Corning, you know, it's the Hallmark mm. Museum of oh, Greeting Cards, goodness. the way it's the Corning Museum of Glass, right? And um, it talks about the history of the greeting card and, you know, personal correspondence and stuff. It's, kind of, it's great. And it's, it really drove home that point of um, a vehicle for expression, mm. personal expression. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching this whole thing go down and it's, I feel like, oh my God, this, this moment is going to be lost. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so they, um, so I was supposed to just go up and stand on the, on the podium and, you know, say a few words, you know, this is Stuban made by this guy. I had this little thing that I prepared and they had approved, okay. you know, sort of name, date, serial number kind of description, mm -hmm. right? You know, here's mm -hmm. Rob Cassani designed it and he's going to say a few words. And I was like, well, this was made by Lynn Labar and, you know, just factual. Right. So, you know, I'm of Mediterranean heritage. So, so I, I just like, I, <laughs> that, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to get some emotional <laughs> response here, or, you know, or I'm, you know, I can't let this moment pass. And I stood up there and, and told the story of his life as I knew it mm -hmm. and kept relating it back to the object, you know, the, the gift mm -hmm. and um, pointing out the symbolism and why things were a certain way and, the, you know, why his personal symbol is the eagle and, you know, things I'd read about him. And I just kind of painted the story and made this object real for them. Mm -hmm. And there were people openly crying in the audience. <laughs> And um, um, and it's just completely off the cuff, you know. It's just I, I had to do it, right? <laughs> so I did it. And then as an epilogue, the next morning we're getting ready to fly home, and um, the phone rings, and it's the the incoming CEO's wife who we'd met, and she said, you know, that was so fabulous night last night. Could you please come into the studio this morning? We'd like to videotape it. It's like. <laughs> I didn't have a script. I mean, <laughs> can I redo that? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to recreate it. And actually, I have the videotape of that. It would be fun to have the library yeah, have a copy so of that. Yeah, I have to look that out. Um, so the this idea, and I'll, this leads to a, kind of what is Stuban, <laughs> and it's it, it's this kind of emotional container. And, you know, that object for them, you know, I, I brought life to it mm -hmm. in my talk and they it really resonated with them. But, you know, when people come in, this, in the Stuban store, they were, you know, one of the categories of the customer was the customer that came in that had to tell you about the piece they owned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That the, this, they had acquired this, it was a huge deal to acquire it either as a gift or by personal purchase. And these are very expensive objects. Mm -hmm. And they invested all of this emotion into them. And then the, the, it became part of their life. There was a story associated with it. And, and, the, and I, you know, it, being in this, in this Stuban store, it would happen all the time. People would come tell you their Stuban story. And it just was amazing to me that this object so much, yeah. resonated so deeply with them. <laughs> and interestingly enough, Object types represented, you could see, you could sort of see them coming. Like they started to say, I have this <laughs> vase, and you would like kind of know what the vase script was. <laughs> or I have this little mm -hmm. animal, and you know, anyway. So Personality one, too. one day I got a, a letter, and uh, customer service forwards it to me, and it says, um, you know, I had this bowl designed by, I think it was George Thompson, and it broke. And so I think it's a complaint letter, mm -hmm. right? I'm starting to read it. It's like I'm, I'm like processing, okay, mm -hmm. this is where this is going. 
and and instead it turns into this basically this love letter to this object <laughs> and how it, they, it came into their lives and that it and then the story of how mm -hmm. this object lived in their lives including you know the the cat used to sleep at an, in it on the <laughs> piano and then and then we moved and I put it into this other place and it meant this to me and it meant that to me and that it and then it you know some something happened and it broke mm -hmm. and it was this sort of um, you know elegy to this you know this love letter to this object that had been in their lives you know this sort of a grieving mm -hmm. the passing of this object thing. Wow. and they felt compelled to send it to Stuban and to send it to the designer mm -hmm. to make that personal to, connection to make that personal yeah. collection connection wow. and, and i'm i mean maybe there are other luxury brands that do that or maybe there are other you know maybe somebody's you know family shotgun or you know some you know heirloom I get that, but this was, it was like, there was something about Subban that would generate this so frequently. What do you think caused that? Was it the dynamics of the people, or was it the, the leadership? I mean, I, I think certainly the leadership in, in maintaining the sort of aura mm -hmm. of the brand, the mystique, mm -hmm. the kind of hushed reverence about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, after I'll pause and say after Chris Hacker, excuse me, after Susan King left as president of Stuben, she her um, she was replaced by this guy named Don Rourke, and um, and Don came from the design world. He was uh, um, one of the great uh, uh, furniture design companies in this country. Is Knoll Furniture? He came from Knoll and had very deep design aesthetic. And, but he was very functionally driven. And so he was always frustrated with the fact that these were decorative objects and not functional objects. He wanted to introduce functional objects. Mm -hmm. and, 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 at, and at one point, you know, I, I said to him, you know, the function of these objects, he sa I said they are functional. Their function is to hold memories. Mm -hmm. and, and the and I truly believe that. I mean, that's that that is that was their mm -hmm. their purpose in people's sure. lives. Maybe when they bought them, they didn't understand that, but it, they turned mm -hmm. into that. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's it's a hard thing to create, and um, and Stuben somehow did it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Any other favorite designs of yours that have stories attached that you want to share? Um, well, I'll, I'll just say uh, that the, the first piece I did, the Hellenic Urn, was so practically driven. Mm -hmm. my, um, my dad was an architect, and, and he always would, you know, in a, in, a, in a loving way, he would, his criticism of me was that I was, he said I was relentlessly practical. <laughs> and, and so this was a relentlessly practical design. It was, mm -hmm. it was um, you know, the it, it it drew on all this imagery of of iconography of of Stuban, cl sort of classic 1930s and 40s Stuban of the th the thick wall and the scroll handle and the and the kind of heroic presence and and from my days on the floor I just I I knew there was a missing there were missing pieces mm -hmm. like I couldn't put the olive dish next to this other thing they just looked weird they together they something. needed a a third, com you know, third companion to make the ensemble mm -hmm. look good, right? So it's very practical. Like when I have this object, it, the store will look better because I can make the arrangement <laughs> look better, you know. Um, and the and the dimensions of it were driven by its companion pieces. And then the opening it was sort of a flower vase, but mm -hmm. the opening was completely driven by what I could get my hand inside of to wash the ins <laughs> the washing inside of. So it just <laughs> sort of designed itself in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's that's kind of one end of the spectrum that they're it's they're it's almost prescriptive. Oh, it, it has to meet all these criteria, mm -hmm. and boom, you know, okay, there it is. And then the other thing is, you know, the retirement gift um, is just completely personal expression. Mm -hmm. You know, just okay. it, it is what it, it is what it needs to be. Um, other objects. 
Well, I would say that I, the, the, um, I, would, um, I took great pleasure in trying to figure out um, answering the desires of marketing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, you know, marketing would say we need a, um, you know, we need something to appeal to, um, you know, financial people, Wall Street types, mm -hmm. right? And it's like every designer would be like rolling their eyes like, you know, again? <laughs> How many times do we need to do this? Um, and uh, you know, we need another. We need another star. Mm -hmm. Stars are stars are successful. We need another star, and it has to cost you know this price point. You know, we have a two hundred fifty dollar one and a thousand dollar one. We need a five hundred fifty dollar one. And so, I just took great delight in trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's a, you know, against that criteria, there's a piece you know called Rising Star, and. Um, uh, my wife worked at Tiffany, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, which is literally next door, and um, and in the design department. I was going to ask if she designed yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, she designed the Tiffany catalog and did all the photography, um, you know, for the product photography. And you know, Tiffany went to school on diamond cutting diamonds, mm -hmm. and so they actually had this awesome manual <laughs> for the the optics of why diamonds sparkle. And um, and so, you know, she brought it home, and it was it was it wasn't a secret. It's something they published for customers, okay. but it, it described the it, it, and because I thought in terms of how things reflect, mm -hmm. I, it really spoke to me. And so I took this the pavilion cut of a diamond and translated it into the star shape. Mm. And um, I, you know, I wasn't as good at figuring out reflections at the time, but I, I kind of intuited it. And then we went and cut the first one. It was like, wow, you know, just <laughs> it's because you know, I you know, you draw it up. It's it's an opaque object. You know, I, I cut it out of foam, okay. pink foam, like you know, use on building insulation. <laughs> cut it with a hot wire. So it's, it's this, and so I'm holding this thing, right? Mm. You can't see in it, which is where the star would show up. <laughs> I'm showing people this thing. It didn't look anything like a star. So it's like, well, when you look in this, it will look like a star. <laughs> It's like everybody's like, uh huh. So I did like a rendering of it. And they're like, well, you sure? Really? It's going to look like that? So, um, you know, I got authorization and we cut one. And so, so, you know, they take a hunk of glass and you grind all the sides. And now it's this gray object. Okay. Right? It's, you, and so it <laughs> looks basically like my piece of styrofoam, except now I've just spent, you know, $1,800 getting this thing cut. And, and so I'm like walking around and it's like, and I'm like, you know, if you, if you uh, put oil on it, or you know the, the the trick is you take your oil from your nose and you, you, can, you can see in there. Every, you know it's an old trick, um, and and you can look in there. You sort of say, oh, all right, you know. So I knew I was convinced it would look good, mm -hmm. but then when they polished it, oh my god, it just I was I was it was just like more than you even like meant. literally <laughs> like my you know my jaw dropped open. It's just wow. It was so fabulous. Um, the. Lloyd Atkins, who designed the hand coolers, mm -hmm. um, told me one one time. He, you know, showed the uh, same deal, right? He's showing a plaster model of this right. thing and eventually be glass. And because of the production process, where you press it, you know, there's a twenty thousand dollar investment before you actually physically see a piece of glass. Wow! So you got to be pretty darn confident <laughs> this yeah. thing's going to look good. <laughs> and um, I remember seeing it, and he was describing it, and the same kind of thing, like. Well, when you look in here, and he's like pointing at this opaque object, trying to get this will vision. happen, <laughs> right? And um, and it, and anyway, and I year after year after year, I saw him doing this work. And at one point, I said, Lloyd, how how accurate are you in understanding it? And he says, you know, about eighty percent. <laughs> he says the rest is all just delightful surprise. <laughs> and you know, I, I, I totally concur. That's exactly <laughs> how it felt. You know, you never. Fully understood what would happen. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now today you can do incredibly good computer modeling and mm -hmm. you know virtually same, understand everything that's going to happen. So there was a the element you know, of surprise. Yeah. Isn't quite there. Yeah. It was. It was very analog. <laughs> <laughs> it was not digital. Mm -hmm. Wow. So your creative inspirations. I know you like to think of how light refracts and how you can translate objects into that. Um, but what are what are some of your other hmm things that inspired you hmm that's a, that's a it's actually a tough a tough one to answer I'm I'm um, um, 
you know, I'm a, an omnivore in terms of you don't have a particular visual inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm inspired by architecture probably mm -hmm. more than anything. Mm -hmm. uh, architecture and interior spaces, um, which may be why I migrated more towards geometric objects because you're making little mini worlds. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really inspired by reflection and light projection and shadow. Mm -hmm. I, I, early in my student days when I was doing store interior design for the stores and lighting the um, exhibits, I, I w was convincing myself I should change careers and become a lighting designer because um, I was so inspired by, uh, by that. Mm -hmm. And um, so th the play of light and shadow, um, I, I look at a lot and mm -hmm. it's, it reflects itself in objects. Um, I live in a Greek revival house now and Greek revival architecture is so much about light and shadow and deep you know, overhangs that create these really dramatic you know, shadows. And um, it, it occurred to me one day that's like, I, didn't, I never really particularly liked Greek Revival, but it was something about the buildings, mm -hmm. and I, I finally put it together that it's, it's this light and shadow thing. <laughs> so, um, um, and then I, so the other source of inspiration is, I want to thank you for asking that question, is what the material can do. So, one of the tenets of design is truth to material. That, that you are designing an object in response to what the material is and what it can do hmm. and leveraging the properties of that material. So, you know, something designed in wood is different than something that's designed in glass because okay. you're responding to the material. And, and it seems like a really simple tenet, but it, it's, it's really hard to, if, if it's like capital T, truth to material, where you're really responding to what the material can do, it's, it's humbling. Hmm. And so um, it really, it, it begs a, a deep investigation and understanding and appreciation and curiosity about the material you're working in. So Stuben was great because it was one material and it was one color and you could, and it, you couldn't do that many things with it. So, so okay, what happens when, with this particular material, if you heat it up and just let it stretch, it's going to stretch in a certain way. And you know, when you pull something out, the, the cross section of the material, it's going to do it in a certain way. And so that you building up your vocabulary and your toolbox of knowledge so that as you draw it, you're being true to the material. Now, I wasn't limited to the maker's quandary of how am I going to pull it out like Rob just asked me to do, right? <laughs> um, but I had a sense of materiality and, and what, it, what it needed to be. Um, that idea, and so the, the, you know, the, the rule of a Steuben object was that, and, and the, really the brand proposition of Steuben was quality craftsmanship design. Mm -hmm. And that and, and the, it was this incredibly um, perfect marriage of those three things. Mm -hmm. Where, and I, I like to say that the, the making, the, the, the manufacturing and the design were in, in this kind of perfect balance. The, the, the material wasn't overpowering the design and the design wasn't overpowering mm -hmm. the material. It was this kind of perfect, you know, it's, like, it's like the best marriage, mm -hmm. right? Where it's, it's the, the two couples kind of, the two people become this one thing. Mm -hmm. And um, great Steuben designs, you know, found that, found that place. Yeah. So we were incredibly lucky as designers to all be exploring this one thing mm -hmm. and all understanding the material so deeply. Mm -hmm. This connects so strongly to my experience at, in, at Corning Museum of Glass because I took it for granted that glass designers all had that experience. Hmm. So if I worked for, you know, glass company X, of course I knew the material deeply. Of course I was in the factory all the time. Of course I understood what the material could and couldn't do. But it turns out that 
that's not what the world is like at all. Really? And so <laughs> the, our, our, our Glass Lab program was conceived as a response to that. Hmm. That you know, I, I, I eventually became convinced that we live in a world, this is a present day statement, mm -hmm. where the understanding of the material in other, ap other materials, wood, clay, paper, ceramic, hmm. you name it, plastic, hmm. <clears throat> designers have a lifetime of understanding those materials. I mean, you understand paper, what it feels like to fold it and cut it, tear it. Mm -hmm. right? Say those words, you, you're <laughs> conjuring up those images, right? <laughs> Even the sound of it when you're do, mm -hmm. doing those things. A designer needs to know, understand all of those things to go design a paper lamp mm -hmm. or even design a book, you know, mm -hmm. a, a uniquely constructed book. And they have a lifetime of understanding that material informing that design moment when they're designing that thing, when they're solving that particular problem. They go to design a piece of glass, they have none of that. There is no place to play and explore. There is no kindergarten class where you're messing around with those materials. The understanding what molten glass can do, that when it's at a certain temperature, you can take a pair of shears and cut it like leather. Designers don't know that. They have no experience in that. So they sit down and they design this object as if it were some other material, as if it were, fun typically, people think of it as plastic. Mm -hmm. So their design is actually not informed by what the material can do. Hmm. Their design cannot be response in response to truth to the material because they have no experience with the material. They've never played with the material. It's hmm. not in their design DNA. So. You can make an argument. You walk through the Corning Museum of Glass and you look at design in the 20th and 21st century and, and basically you just say to yourself, what would happen if those people actually knew what the material could do? <laughs> yeah. And they've done some pretty good stuff without knowing it, mm -hmm. but what, imagine if they knew. Mm -hmm. So our Glass Lab program and a number, a number of other similar programs that have evolved in the last decade tries to build that familiarity with designers to the material. Mm -hmm. All they have to do is bring their sketchbook and we bring all the resources, the glass maker, the hot glass, all the equipment, and they can play and experiment and get a sense of what the material can do. And that, that program, which we continue to support today, we're blowing glass in France in a couple weeks mm -hmm. in a workshop that's doing exactly that, was born of the, my experience of being at Stuben mm -hmm. and, and having the luxury of learning about this yeah. material firsthand and wanting other designers to get a, at least a taste of that. Mm -hmm. wow. So, and, and I work for a place, by the way, that's awesomely allows that sort of thing to happen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in your vision. So in 2008, I think it was, when was it Schottenstein stores bought yes. Stuban, mm -hmm. and then subsequently they, they closed yep. a few years later. How did you feel about that? Well, I, I, as I've said, you, don't, you, you, don't, you, you leave Stuban bitter. So I already was bitter. <laughs> 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 um, the, um, so it was uh, shocking that um, that uh, the decision was made to sell Stuban, mm -hmm. and it was completely rational that the decision was being made. I, you know, I felt it, in some way that those two things cancel, canceled each other out. I was, mm -hmm. you know, I was relatively neutral on it. The, the, I spent a lot of time talking, you know, uh, over the years with Tom Beekner, who was president of Stuban. He's faced the same set of problems that mm -hmm every leader at Stuben faced in terms of the aging customer and what would appeal. Mm -hmm. And really the sort of fundamental question of why, why does Stuben even exist? Mm -hmm. Okay, if, if it broke even, great. If Stuben, if Stuben uh, you know, hovered around being a 
$30 million company mm -hmm. for many, many years, $25, $30 million company. If they had a banner year and made a million dollars or $2 million, did that really even matter to the corporation? I think it mattered emotionally, mm -hmm. but that additional contribution didn't really add up to a lot. Mm -hmm. So Tom really was always pushing on, well, look at all the things Stuben is, this container for emotions mm -hmm. that people is so important in people's lives, the gift of state. Mm -hmm. Even if you lose a little, little money, isn't that worth it? Mm -hmm. And so for many years, mm -hmm. that was worth it. Right. And and the world changed, and, and the equation didn't work anymore. And so mm -hmm. the decision was made to sell it. What was interesting about that was that the sale liberated Stuben to experiment and do things that him had talked about for a long time. Um, outsourcing, pushing um, the boundary of what's acceptable from a quality perspective mm -hmm. and what's not. Uh, different manufacturing techniques that were, for instance, stemware production, mm -hmm. which was impractical in the Corning factory, was you know um, outsourced. Um, very active uh, investigation, alternate manufacturing techniques. So there was a great liberation in in that mm -hmm. experimentation um, that was going on. So um, in one in one way, I was delighted to see that. Mm -hmm. um, I. I feel like there was a loss of the sense of um, that virtuosity in design mm -hmm. and that um, the I would see things introduced and, it, and I did not say that's too bad yeah. right and so I, I I never came to grips with that and mm -hmm. um, in fact in, at some level felt like you know from a design perspective at least they they had lost their way mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so I I wasn't surprised that in, in the end it didn't work out for them. What do you think is the enduring legacy of Stuben? Um, it's hard to separate my own personal response to that mm -hmm. from you know a more detached view of it. Um, I mean, in many ways, to me, Stuben represents is symbolic of an age of um, obsessive quality mm -hmm. and, and attention to detail and making, um, and that and that today and and that idea endures. Mm -hmm. That you know, and, and I think we see it today in a, in different manifestations. The the kind of return, you know, kind of the, kind of the maker movement, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, um, is, is symbolic of that. Of people making these obsessively gorgeous objects um, it is very much in the spirit of, mm -hmm. of what Stuben um, was. I think the difference with Stuben was this um, kind of hyper luxury object that actually was a hyper luxury right. object. We have that idea today, but it's not. R right. It, yeah. it, you know, it's, it's marketed as, as such. Yeah. Okay. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, but, you know, the, you know, there were, when Stuben lost money, in which they did almost every year of their existence, you could actually run the math and say, you know, every box that went out the door had an extra hundred dollars in it <laughs> or 200 or 500 dollars mm -hmm. in it that was investment, right? That was being given to the customer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that's not, you don't run companies like that, right? But, but, the, uh, it, it, but the objects themselves, w with a, a st you know, a, a knowledgeable eye looking at this, these objects, they are crazy perfect. Mm -hmm. um, that to me, that's, and I hadn't really articulated it before, but the idea of the hyper-luxurious object that actually was mm -hmm. a hyper-luxurious right. object. Perfection. So, as an artist and designer, what, what is your enduring legacy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Sorry, tough question. <laughs> 
I, well, I think, I think my legacy, I'm blessed because, um, you know, unlike many of my colleagues who designed for Stuban, their, their moment with Stuban was their moment with Stuban. Mm -hmm. And if that was my legacy, that would be great. But I'm lucky enough to have come to the museum where so many of the lessons mm -hmm. for me artistically and as a designer um, and the knowledge that I brought with me from Stuban completely translated mm -hmm. to being here at the museum. The, I used to, you know, I used to bring people to the factory floor and talk to them describing the process of making a piece of Stuban. And I, the factory's loud, so I'm standing close to you and I'm talking you know, into your ear so you can hear me. And I'm saying, and now he's doing this and now he's reheating it. And, and so that, that is our hot glass demonstration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That one-on-one -on -one personal, personal thing connection, yeah. turned into a demonstration of the Corning Museum of Glass. Mm -hmm. The, the, you know, the truth to material lesson and understanding and awakening turned into our glass lab program. Mm -hmm. um, the process of, as well as the whole the, you know, design process in many ways, is reflected in the, des in, in the glass lab program, where it's just all it is is a sketch. Mm -hmm. And then we'll make it for you. Mm -hmm. Let's discover yeah. what this glass is. Um, I mean, those are just two examples. So in many ways, my, I feel like my design legacy and artistic le legacy has, has been transferred to a lot of the programmatic yeah. elements and here at the museum. Writ large as yeah. well. Yeah, so. yeah. And it's, and that personal delight that I got is, is, you know, shared with a whole bunch of people. Right, exactly. Wonderful. Is there anything else you want to say about Stuben before we close? I think we're about out of time. Okay. Um. Hmm. You know, I, I think I would just say that it was, um, it was not a big company. The, there were maybe 150 people who worked there, including manufacturing, when, when I was there. Um, there was an, an intimacy and a passion mm -hmm. a, a, um, a, about the place. People cared deeply about mm -hmm. it, too deeply <laughs> about it. Um, it, it was a, it was unusual in the amount of love that people felt mm -hmm. about it, passion about mm -hmm. it. Um, so that was true across the organization. The, what really struck me, and this came through when we were originally con working on the expansion of the museum in the 1990s. I was, I was on loan from Stuben to Corning to help plan the expansion of the museum, museum, Corning Museum of Glass in the 1990s. And I remember the designer asking me about, well, what is it about Stuben? And, 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 and I said, you know, so they're melting this perfect material. And it's, it's you know, it's flowing through platinum. It's, it's this perfect, perfect, there is no better, more perfect crystal, lead crystal in the world. And there are a bunch of scientists worrying about it every single day, that it's <laughs> perfect, perfect, perfect. Believe me, it's perfect. And then there's this whole process of making the object that is attempting to maintain that perfection. In terms of the material, surface quality and all that stuff, but then a design that somehow enhances the material, mm -hmm. quality craftsmanship and design. And so the, it goes through this, you know, you have to design it, but then it goes through this whole manufacturing process where they're barely touching it, really, so that it, 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 it holds on to that sort of ideal of perfection. And then it gets to the very end, and there's an inspector, the lowest paid person in the factory, the person that sweeps the floor makes more money. And the inspector sits there, inspecting it, looking at the details, 
And we're talking about where two edges come together and they're, it's been beveled so you don't cut yourself. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just like a little 45 degree yeah. chamfer. Well, that too has been hand polished with jeweler's rouge to make it perfect. And if there's gray in that bevel, which is a, like a 64th yeah. of an inch across, they send it back to get that thing fixed. Wow. The level of obsessive, uh, people obsessing about quality, and then when it's done, and it meets that person's criteria, and that, the, re the reason I point out that they were low pay isn't because they weren't... Important. <laughs> and they didn't <laughs> care about it. Right. They were completely passionate about mm. it. They cared just as much about the quality, maybe even more so than the person at the very top of the yeah. organization. And it was there, in the end, they had to sign it in diamond points, to Ben. Mm -hmm. And then it would get packed in acid-free tissue inside of a gray linen bag, mm -hmm. inside, inside of a gray flannel bag, inside of a gray linen box. Mm -hmm. And that... Perfection. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. That was, to me, that just that trying to maintain that ideal. Through all of that process, that yeah was so clearly understood by even the, you know, the lowest paid person in the factory mm -hmm. is stunning to me. Right. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome it's very much. Great. Thank you. <laughs>